Good morning, River Life Church. I'm Elle Four Rhodes, the Spiritual Growth Director here. Our scripture reading for today will be Acts 1, verse 1 through 8. This is Luke, the physician, writing to Theophilus, and we are going to see the beginning of um, the, the early, the first century church. So here's the reading for today. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is our scripture reading for today. And I invite you to listen for the Holy Spirit as we hear the sermon, as uh, you have heard the scriptures here. After the sermon, we're going to have a time of sharing where you get to talk about uh, what you've learned, what the Holy Spirit has said to you. And there are questions that are in your bulletin that you can use to guide our time of sharing. So if you look at the 12 disciples in the Gospels, and then those same disciples in the book of Acts, it would seem like they were completely different people. You see, in the Gospels, these disciples were flawed and filled with problems. They had wrong priorities. They constantly misunderstood Jesus. They made boasts they couldn't back up. They denied, betrayed, doubted Jesus, and they refused to believe in a crucified Messiah. And then in Acts, just a couple months later, we see them doing incredible things. Peter preached powerful, convicting sermons. They baptized thousands. Peter and John healed a paralyzed man. They stood with confidence in front of the most powerful men in Jerusalem. The other disciples performed many signs and wonders. And after the book of Acts, every one of them died for their faith. Many displaying incredible courage in the face of torture. These were not the same people. A bunch of foolish fearful, self-absorbed nobodies became bold, wise, miracle workers who literally changed the course of human history. How is this possible? How is that possible? A transformation like that should take years. This happened in months. How is this possible? Well, they were transformed by the Holy Spirit. That is the only difference that happened between the Gospels and Acts. They were transformed by the Holy Spirit. But they weren't just changed. They were transformed by the Holy Spirit with power for kingdom ministry. Author Ray Hollenbach describes it like this. In John 20, 22, Jesus filled the disciples with the Holy Spirit, and as a result, over some time, 
they became surprisingly like Jesus in thought, word, and deed. Ordinary people declared the message of the kingdom of God, just as Jesus had done, and demonstrated the coming of the kingdom with powerful actions, just as Jesus had done. By the Holy Spirit, the first believers discovered a transformation from the impossibilities of the flesh to the possibilities of heaven. Are you living in the impossibilities of flesh? Or have you been transformed into the possibilities of heaven? That is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you hear about the Holy Spirit, you hear me talking about this, you might be getting a little anxious. I I get that. If you're not a Christian, this might sound like some weird hocus pocus. But it's true. That thing you feel powerless to defeat, God has power for you. The impact you want to make in the world, or even in just your family, God has power for you. Maybe you come from a shaman background. And the idea of the Holy Spirit power probably sounds ludicrous. Because you're thinking, we don't get spiritually empowered. The shaman does. That's literally what they do. That is their spiritual gift. They get empowered, not me. Well, I want to tell you that in God's kingdom, you can have a direct relationship with the Creator of Heaven, the God of Heaven, through Jesus Christ. And you can receive His power directly. And you can hear His voice directly. Maybe you're more of a humanist. And and you might rationalize this as positive self-talk or self-actualization. Well, if you talk with someone who walks in the power of the Spirit, and lives in relationship with the Spirit, and lives out the fruit of the Spirit. You talk to them, and you'll see it's way more than just human motivation. Or maybe you grew up in a Hmong church, and you might be getting nervous because your pastor never talks about the Holy Spirit. Or maybe they even told you that the Holy Spirit doesn't work like that today, like he did in the Bible. So however you're feeling, don't worry. The disciples were a little anxious at first, also. See, the book of Acts begins with the resurrected Jesus giving instructions to the apostles through the Holy Spirit. That's verse 2. And then this happens in verse 4 and 5. Once while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus told them something radical was about to change in their relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, we're not going to get into getting baptized with the Holy Spirit. All of that's going to happen next week. Okay, so we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit. All of that's going to happen next week, so come back. It's good. So we won't touch that yet. But something radical was going to change in their relationship, in their understanding of the Holy Spirit. And they immediately thought about their own kingdom. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? The promised Messiah was going to free Israel from Roman oppression and establish the kingdom of Israel again and rebuild the temple and and return Israel to its rightful place. You see, they understood the idea of power. But they didn't understand the idea of God's kingdom. All they could imagine was their own kingdom. The impossibilities of the flesh. Now, see, some of you understand the idea of power. But all you can think about is building your own kingdom. You're stuck in the impossibilities of the flesh. 
Here's what Jesus said to them and you. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus had power in mind. He even had a kingdom in mind. But it wasn't a geopolitical kingdom. And it wasn't in the timing that the disciples imagined. But most importantly, he gave the disciples a task. Be my witnesses. So, you see, the disciples weren't completely wrong. Jesus was going to restore a kingdom. In fact, through the resurrection and the ascension that was about to happen, Jesus was taking his rightful place on the throne of heaven, seated at the right hand of God. And therefore, he was about to become Israel's promised Messiah and King, and the rightful king of the world. And you see, back in the first century, when a new king was enthroned, they would send heralds out all across the land, all across the kingdom. And those heralds would go out to announce, we have a new king. That was how the word spread. That was their Twitter. They didn't have anything else. So these heralds these messengers would be sent out to the farthest reaches of the kingdom to announce that a new king was here. And that announcement was even called good news. That's what Jesus is telling his disciples to do. And that's what Jesus is telling us to do. But he says that we that we and they won't do it alone. God will give his messengers, his heralds, power through the Holy Spirit. The disciples needed that power, and so do we. See, we need that power to report good news. We need that power to report that a new king is on the throne. And that king is good and just and loving. And he wants to bring healing and forgiveness to his creation. He wants to restore his people and his world. He wants to bring life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this new king His kingdom is marked by forgiveness, justice, restoration, and peace. To build up the kingdom of God and invite others like us to join Him. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just an invitation to church. See, Jesus is already appointed and enthroned as the world's true king. And one day that kingdom will come, finally and fully. And in the meantime, we have a job to do. See, this passage paints a picture, a contrast, between the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of Israel is what the disciples asked about. The kingdom of God is what Jesus was talking about. But there's another contrast. It's a little more subtle. This moment in time marks a transition from disciple power to Holy Spirit power. And every one of us aligns somewhere in these contrasts. Somewhere in here. What kingdom are you building? We're all building something. We all spend time, energy, money, every single day. We are all building something. 
Are you building your kingdom or God's? Likewise, we're either doing it by our own power or by God's power. We're doing it one or the other. And this can change from day to day, even morning to afternoon. But at any point, we're living by God's power or our power. And just because you have the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're living by His power. So if we take these contrasts and we build a little two-by-two matrix of it, we can see where we fall. You can see where you fall in the middle of this story. So here's what it would look like. Across the top, you have the question of, are you living by the Holy Spirit's power? No, yes. And then along the side, are you living as a witness to God's kingdom or a witness to your own kingdom? So let's talk about these boxes. And my bet is you're going to fall into one of these. Maybe a couple of them and you flip back and forth. Well, let's talk about the first one. What would it look like if you were not living under the Holy Spirit's power and not building God's kingdom? Right in that, that blue box there. You would be using your own power and your own kingdom. In the gospel, this was the Pharisees. Now, we don't see them in in this story, but they're prominent throughout the gospels. The Pharisees were the religious leaders who built an incredible kingdom around being a Pharisee and around how they saw loving God. And they worked harder than anybody else to do what they thought was loving and honoring and obeying God. But fundamentally, when something threatened their power, when someone threatened their position, their kingdom, they executed him. That's what it looks like to build your own kingdom by your own power. And and Jesus' own accusation was that all of their work actually drove people further away from God. Let's talk about the other box. What would it look like if you were living under the Spirit's power, but not building God's kingdom? That's that little maroon box there. Okay, I call this the My Kingdom Christian. See, in the Gospels, this was sometimes the disciples. In our lives, this is the Christian, this is the believer whose life revolves around their family, their career, their priorities. And being a witness, a herald to the new king of the universe usually becomes an afterthought. These are the people you usually can tell. You spend a little time with them and you can tell that their world is about their kingdom. It's about them. Okay, now how about the yellowish one there? What would it look like if you were living for God's kingdom, but not doing it by the Holy Spirit's power? See, I call this the try-harder Christian. These folks usually have a really good heart, and they work hard to be good Christians. They're trying to do God's work, but doing it by their own power, in their own way. Now, if this is you, you do good stuff. You try hard to attend church consistently. You pray, you read, you give, you serve. You do all of this. But sometimes you don't see a whole lot of fruit from your labor. Or you're tired. Or you're discouraged. Or you're straight up burnt out. And you don't even really want to go to church anymore. So you're trying to chop wood with a butter knife. And you don't have the power to do it. But you keep trying. See, I know this box because I live in this box sometimes. 
As anyone who knows me or sees me around the office here, I'm a workhorse. And I get an amazing amount of stuff done. But there are times where I get tired and discouraged. Because I know I'm doing it by my own power. I'm not relying on the Holy Spirit nearly as much as I should. And so some of my life is spent in this box. And I know for you, some of your life is spent in this box too. But there's one more box. There's one more option. Being a witness to God's kingdom, being a herald, announcing the good news, that there is a new king and doing all of that while being supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit. The green box up there. That's a picture of the Spirit-empowered Christian. That's the disciples in the book of Acts. That's what we see from the passage we just read, starting in a matter of just a few verses. In chapter 2, we begin to see the disciples as spirit-empowered Christians. That's the disciples. Speaking boldly. Doing literal miracles. Expanding God's kingdom. Connecting the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers to the Old Testament law and sacrifice system. And thousands believed in this new king. These are the disciples transformed by the Holy Spirit with power for kingdom ministry. The Spirit empowered Christian is someone transformed by the Holy Spirit with power for kingdom ministry. All three parts Holy Spirit. Power, kingdom, all centered around God. So where do you fall on this chart? Whose kingdom are you building? Whose power are you using? Let me remind you of this powerful truth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. You will be witnesses to the kingdom of God. It's the same today as it was then. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power. And you will be witnesses to the kingdom of God. Join me in prayer. God, thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, we thank you for your presence inside, in every believer. Lord, I pray for those here who are living by their own power and are tired and discouraged. Holy Spirit, will you empower them? Will you fill more of them? Encourage more of them. Strengthen more of them. God, Father God, give us a heart for your kingdom. Let us be heralds to say there is a new king who is a good king. Give us the power to speak boldly to love courageously, to take risks, to forgive abundantly, and to show kindness to all. As we reflect your kingdom, let us be kingdom builders empowered by the Holy Spirit to announce you. Lord, let us announce you 
not us. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.